Uh, good day, everybody, whether it's morning, evening, or midday for you. Uh, this is going to be a quick um, talk on my first books when I started this many years ago, ooh, back in the 90s. And I started mainly on the Old Testament and the connections that I saw uh, with the Israelites and the Hyksos. And you're going to wonder who on earth uh, the Hyksos were. They were uh, immigrants into Egypt. So the Hyksos are supposed to have come out of Mesopotamia. They were a highly literate and technical civilization that came out of Mesopotamia. And they went down into Egypt, not necessarily peaceably, but um, by various means, they took over Egypt and they became the dominant uh, civilization in the north of Egypt, in lower Egypt. And they had their own line of pharaohs. So we had a divided Egypt, as was often the case. We had pharaohs in the south down in Thebes and we had Hyksos pharaohs up in the north in the Nile Delta. And they slowly spread their influence further south uh, into Egypt, into southern Egypt. Um, but my point of interest is I saw many commonalities here between the Israelites and the Hyksos uh, and their two Exodus events. So that's what we're going to look at first of all here. Um, that these two Exodus events were very similar because the Hyksos after a couple of hundred years, so they went down there in sort of, uh, I don't know, 1750, 1800 BC. And then after a couple of hundred years or so down in Egypt, they managed to get themselves kicked out of Egypt on an exodus. And it just so happens that that sort of exodus is rather familiar. And uh, we are going to have a look at some of those similarities. So, uh, first of all, both of these people, the Israelites and the Hyksos, had a leader called Jacob or Jacob. Now, in Egypt, he was called Jacobam. And we probably have a, a cartouche of this somewhere. I wonder if I can do a quick share. Can we do a quick share on this? So, if I go into screen share and pick a window and share that one. Now, is that going to come up? Yeah, there we go. That sounds good to me. And uh, here is the cartouche for Pharaoh Yakabam or Jacob, you could say. Uh, we read it from the left here. You can probably see my cursor going round and round. Um, two reed glyphs. That's uh, uh, if you read this within history, they'll say the reed glyph is uh, an A sound, but it's not the A that we would normally say. It's more like an E, and especially when you get two of them together, it's E. Um, there's no vowels, of course, so you have to make up the vowels. Then we have a K, so the dish is a K. Uh, the foot is a B. Um, and then the arm is an A. And the this might be a determinative on the end uh, of the three water glyphs, which can either be M or it can mean something to do with water as a determinative. So we get yak. Or maybe Jacob, something to do with water. So it could be just Jacob, something to do with water. Uh, and that was the name of a Hyksos pharaoh of Egypt. Um, oh, while we're here, this is just to show that the Hyksos were a literate and technical civilization. This is the uh, mathematical papyri which is now in the uh, uh, British Museum in London. And it's a mathematical papyri, as the name states. And it's full of much of the standard mathematics that we would understand today. And this comes out of the Hyksos era. Uh, so this is a very old text indeed, going back three and a half thousand years. Uh, just showing how 
uh, educated and literate the Hyksos people were. Um, so, yeah, that was just part one of the comparisons between the Israelites and the Hyksos. Yeah, so they both had a king called Jacob or Jacob. Uh, they were both circumcised. They both wore the payot, the um, side lock of hair that uh, Jews today even wear. They both wore earrings because the Israelites used to wear earrings until after the um, exodus, and then they buried their ear earrings for some reason, <clears throat> which is why you don't see uh, Jews today with earrings, but they used to. The Israelites used to wear earrings. They were both called shepherds. So you know from the Old Testament that the um, uh, Israelite patriarchs were all known as shepherds, and this is portrayed as being shepherds um, from agricultural sort of uh, artisans uh, caring for sheep in a field. But of course, that's not the case, I don't think, because the Hyksos were known as the shepherd kings. Now, they were. we can discuss this later. They had other names, but... Um, uh, in Egyptian, they were called the Haika Kasut. And in fact, I've got the uh, cartouche for that here, actually. Since we're here, we might as well look at that. This is the, uh, in Egyptian, it was known as the Haikau Kasut, um, which the Greeks reinterpreted as Hyksos. Well, that's where we get Hyksos. Or in America, you tend to say Hyksos, but there we go. Tomato, tomato. Um, it's much the same. In fact, Josephus says you can pronounce Hyksos in two different ways. So even Josephus says that both forms are acceptable. Um, so this cartouche, um, this is the um, shepherd's crook glyph. That gives you a good idea of what <laughs> this word means. Uh, they've got the shepherd crook's glyph, which is a high, and then the uh, triangular is... Um, uh, a K sound, hike, uh, and the hika, the bird here. I forget which bird this is. I think it's some sort of crow. Is an A sound, hika, and then the circle is a K, K, and then this is supposed to be a bolt or something, a lock, a padlock sort of thing. Um, I suppose they they used to join things together with a piece of rope and a seal. So maybe that's what it's supposed to be. This is an S sound. Uh, and then we've got a T down the bottom. So we get uh, kasut, uh, with a determinative on the end of the three hills glyph, which tends to mean foreigner, according to classical Egyptology. Um, not sure that it does, because this determinative glyph, glyph is not always used to denote foreigners. It's referring to hills, but of course there are not many hills within Egypt, so we don't know which hills they are. I suggested that it might refer to um, pyramids or something like that. But anyway, Haikau Kasut, that's the uh, Hyksos. And they were known as shepherd kings. That's why they have the shepherd's crook. Um, so, when they got thrown out of Egypt, <clears throat> they had a civil war, obviously, between the northern Egyptians, the Hyksos, and the southern Egyptians down in Thebes. Uh, a number of things happened. There was darkness for a number of days. We have this from the Tempest Stella of Pharaoh Armosi I. Armosi I was the pharaoh who kicked these um, Hyksos out of Egypt. This is circa... 1600 uh, BC to about 1580 BC, something like that. So there was darkness for a number of days. There was a pillar of fire and a pillar of smoke. There was a great ash fall. Um, and the waters were parted by a tsunami. Well, the waters were parted. Um, and the air was too thick to breathe. We get that from Josephus. So Josephus has his own version uh, of the Old Testament Exodus. And he says the air was too thick to breathe and the people were inwardly consumed. 
Hmm. So what's all this talking about? I think it was talking about this because it's coincident in the date. Um, I think it was, if I just scan down a little bit, this. Well, not precisely this, of course, because we don't have any photos going back to 1580 BC, but there we go. Um, this is a more recent eruption. And I think that's what they're talking about when they say there was a pillar of fire and a pillar of smoke, because that's what we get with a large eruption. We get a pillar of fire and a pillar of smoke. So it's indicating there was a large eruption at this time, just before the Exodus. And of course, if you look into the sort of 1150s, 1200, when the classical date for the Exodus is normally located in the Ramesside period, um, there is no great eruption that could be the basis for the pillar of fire and pillar of smoke. Um, but of course, if we go back to 1580 BC, there was a very well-known eruption. And that was the eruption of Thera, or Santorini, as it's often called. I tend to call it Santorini. And that blew its top. This was an island just north of Crete uh, in the Aegean that blew its top in about 1580 BC. And it was the largest explosion in recorded history, uh, bigger than Krakatoa. I've seen estimates of 10 times the size of Krakatoa. This was a big deal. It affected everybody uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean basin. And um, it not only had a, um, an eruption, which virtually it destroyed the island of Santorini, um, and the people who lived there, who were Minoans, uh, they abandoned their town. Nobody was ever found in that town. So they had sufficient warning to evacuate the uh, area before it blew its top. And they went to Greece, we believe, um, to the Minoan civilization there uh, on Crete, um, to, to Minos. But this was a maritime um, eruption. It was an island that fell down into the sea. Uh, a little bit like Atlantis. So um, this was a big volcano, and I'm not sure if viewers are familiar with these volcanoes, but you get this big magma chamber underneath the island, which grows and grows and grows, just like is happening uh, in Iceland today, where they talk about this big magma chamber under the, um, the western side of uh, Iceland, which is threatening that town. They had to evacuate that town. Same happened with Santorini. They had this enormous magma chamber underneath the island, which blew its top, but it, not as a huge, great explosion. This blew its top over maybe as much as a year, maybe even slightly more. So it was huffing and puffing for quite some time with these enormous, great eruptions of ash looking a bit like this, blowing this ash right up into the stratosphere. Um, but eventually, of course, this magma chamber underneath the island is va evacuated. It's empty. It's blown all of its material out of the top of the volcano. And what happens is the island above collapses into the void. And in Santorini, it really did collapse. It went down uh, so that the uh, seabed was something like 2,000 foot deep. It went down a long way. And as you can imagine, that amount of displacement of water, sucking water into this big void where the island once was, will cause a tsunami. So this uh, map here is a map of the tsunami. Um, these are not my uh, predictions. This came from a computer simulation of what would happen. Um, as the tsunami runs out, because it has to run out between um, Crete, this is the island of Crete, and this is the Greek island of, um, I forget which one this is. Um, anyway, it's one of the um, Greek islands just off the coast of Turkey, which is here. 
and the tsunami has to run between these islands and over these high pieces of high ground under the sea and it distorts the wave as it comes out and then it runs out across the mediterranean and it runs out at a very high speed these tsunamis normally run at about something like 400 miles an hour so they are rushing out across the mediterranean and of course at some point they hit the nile delta which is down here the green bit that's the nile delta and they will cause a tsunami they will cause a parting of the waters just as it's described in the old testament account of the uh, exodus more importantly because this was a subduction um tsunami so it was caused by the sinking of the island into the sea and the sea rushing in to replace that void the first thing that will happen with this tsunami is that the sea will disappear and that's pretty much the same as we had with the indonesian um tsunami so this is an image of the indonesian tsunami which is quite a few years ago now. It's probably about 15 years ago or so, at least 10 years, I imagine. Um, and here you see we have three women walking out along the seabed because the sea has disappeared and it can disappear. If you have a shelving beach like the Nile Delta, because that's just sedimentary material, of course, from the Nile. Um, if you have a shallow shelving beach, the sea can run out for miles. It can just disappear from view completely. And all you have is a few fish flopping up and down in the shallows that you can go and catch for your breakfast, maybe. Um, this is what it was talking about with the army of the Egyptians getting caught out because the waters parted and then the waters flooded back in again. And you can see on this image the waters flooding back in again. These women sitting on this beach don't know what's happening. The sea has gone out. They don't realize that this big wall of white water in the distance, that's the sea coming back in again. And these three women will be dead in the space of 15, 10, 15 minutes as that wall of water rushes back in again. And that is what happened to the Egyptian army. Um, and forget about the Red Sea business, because you know if you read it in the English, it says that they crossed the Red Sea. That's not what it says. It was the, um, the Suf, um, Suf Yam, I think it was in the uh, Hebrew, which means the Reed Sea, not the Red Sea. And of course, along the coastline there, there are a number of marshes where they are reed beds and that's what it was talking about. It was talking about the coastal waters next to the Mediterranean. And that is where the um, Egyptian army got caught out. Now, why didn't the Israelites get caught out? Well, maybe they were a bit more sensible. Maybe they had seen uh, previous tsunamis. Because remember, Thera Santorini had been huffing and puffing for up to a year, maybe longer. Uh, perhaps they had had already some minor tsunamis, just a meter or two uh, deep, and they'd seen the water go out, and they'd seen the water rush back in again. And so they decided this was a bad idea to go rushing out on the beach to catch all the fish. Um, better to retreat inland because you know the sea is going to come back with a vengeance. Uh, but the southern Egyptians wouldn't have known that because they did not live along the Mediterranean. They didn't even know what a sea was down in southern Egypt, and they had no idea what a tsunami was. And they got caught out, and they were destroyed by the tsunami. Um, and then we have Josephus. We've already talked about this. Josephus saying that the air was too thick to breathe. Well, it was. Um, this is the ash that came out of Santorini. Now, this is on the uh, north bank of Santorini. So some of the island, a ring um, of the island sort of uh, still remains. You can go there today. It's very expensive. If you go as a tourist, be prepared to 
spend 10 or 15 dollars on a cup of coffee but there we go that's that's the penalties of going to a tourist trap um but these white cliffs these are the ash that came out of the volcano and you can see it's in layers so you can see that it didn't all come out at once it came out one week and then the next week and then the next month and then there was a gap and maybe two months later they had more but these cliffs are 60 meters deep that's how much ash came out of uh the volcano at santorini and these so they they compress into pumice this is all pumice which is the lightweight sort of fluffy material that comes out of a volcano these are probably the um origins of the floating islands so we get this in greek history and we get this in arthurian history who have remembered this strange case of the floating islands um so the knights of the round table they jump onto a magical ship they're always running onto magical ships that takes them to new places and new eras and this ship takes them to a floating island and this floating island is floating around the mediterranean and it's completely barren apart from some birds and it's hot if you want to walk on it you burn your feet it's still hot and it rocks side to side as if it was going to tip over in the sea and it's just floating around in the mediterranean and it's huge this thing is well if if you look at it in Arthurian legend, it's it's like a hundred miles across, but obviously that's an exaggeration. <laughs> Even if we say it's a kilometer across, it's still huge. And then it gets caught. Um, it grinds on the bottom of the Mediterranean when it gets close to an island, and it goes round and round and round because it's stuck. Um, in Arthurian legend, they say it's stuck because of magnetism, but obviously the bottom of this island has got stuck. Um, on a rock in the bottom of the uh, uh, Mediterranean, and it's spinning around on itself. Now, that's a very unusual description. And how would you dream up that description of a floating island? It seems rather bizarre, but it's exactly what you would find if someone back in this era had recorded what had happened after the uh, Santorini eruption, because these cliffs ran right out into the sea. Um, they didn't just end on the island. These um, cliffs would have gone out across the sea, because remember, pumice is lighter than water, so it will float. And eventually, if you get a, uh, a piece of pumice that's 50 meters deep, it can break off and it can run across the Mediterranean as a floating island that would indeed perhaps be hot. And it certainly would be barren, so that the only things on it would be a few birds. And it would float around the Mediterranean until it got caught on a piece of shallow ground somewhere uh, where it might indeed spin round and round and round. Seems like someone, one of the authors of Arthurian legend, picked up one of these bits of information that's been floating around uh, ever since the dawn of time and included it in their story because they thought it was interesting. Has nothing to do with Arthurian legend, of course. It's just a, they keep having these little diversions in Arthurian legend of something um, amazing that happened. So I think those bits of Arthurian legend are actually true. And it's an ancient memory of what happened at Santorini. And as far as Josephus was concerned, he said that the air was too thick to breathe and people were inwardly consumed by the dust from Santorini. And yep, that's exactly what you would have. This um, is quite a famous picture, especially for Americans. Um, this is Mount St. Helens. And this is obviously a local town close to Mount St. Helens. I don't know what the local town would be actually. And you see the car running through the ash and stirring up the ash. And yes, you don't want to be breathing this um, because it contains lots of silica shards and it will inwardly consume you. Um, in fact, there's a good picture also. Uh, I haven't got it here, but I had a picture of the um, 
police. And it wasn't only the people getting inwardly consumed, it was the uh, cars as well. So the police put a big bin on the front of the car with an enormous great filter um, on it to go into the car because the engines were being inwardly consumed by all of this sharp silica dust. Yeah, it's not very good to be breathing this stuff in. So Josephus Flavius was perfectly correct when he said that people were probably being inwardly consumed. Um, so, yes, so there was this war, I think because of this big tragedy, because of the tragedy of the plagues, there was a war between the um, Hyksos and the Egyptians. Um, oh, and one thing before we get on to that war is here we have um, four or five black swans. Now, I, you're probably familiar with black swans, but anyway, for those who aren't, a black swan is something so unusual, you could never invent it. It was named after the swans of Perth down in Australia, because we all know what a swan looks like all over Europe. Um, I presume all over the Americas and so on, a swan is a big white bird that likes to swim on rivers. And then you go down to Perth in Australia and the swans are black. Now, who would have predicted that just in this one place, there would be a jet black swan? That's why these are known as uh, black swan events. Um, but here with this, um, uh, with, with this explanation uh, of the exodus, of the plagues before the exodus, we have about four or five black swans. We have the darkness for a number of days. Um, oh, there was a rainfall as well, which I've not put in there. There was a rainfall. There was a pillar of fire, a pillar of smoke. There was the great ash fall. Um, and then the waters being parted, the great tsunami, and then the air being too thick to breathe. All of these things are connected with a maritime volcano. But how on earth would a chronicler from 3,500 years ago, know that all these things could be linked. You would never invent that story. You could not invent that story. It's impossible to have five or six black swans all in the same story. And yet they are there. And the only way I think that could ever happen is if the chronicler had actually seen it happen. So it was an eyewitness account of the eruption of Cena, uh, of, of Santorini, the long range fallout from Santorini, including the ash fall, which comes from Exodus 9.8, if I remember correctly. Um, but that ash fall, uh, what does it say? It says, um, Moses, no, God said unto Moses, take you handfuls of ash from the hearth of a fire and cast it up into the sky, and it will become a small dust across the lands of Egypt. <clears throat> Which is exactly what happened. That's exactly what you would get from the long-range fallout from Santorini. Small dust across the lands of Egypt. And we know that that happened because they found some of this dust in some of the strata. Most of the dust actually went over Anatolia, um, and even over into the Levant. Um, into uh, Lebanon and uh, Judea. Uh, but uh, some of it did go over Egypt. And so they would have got this ash fall, just as is described in Exodus 9.8. It's a perfect description of the long-range fallout from a large volcano. Um, <clears throat> so yes, all of this mayhem caused a civil war because someone was to blame for this. You know, these are not natural events. The gods must have caused this event and someone must have upset the gods. You know, who, who was it? Well, it was you. And of course, the other people would say, no, it was you. And so we end up with a civil war between the southern Egyptians and the Hyksos in the north. And so, and yeah, there was a civil war. If, if you read the, um, 
account of the Exodus, it's, it's not just slaves being pushed out of Egypt. It does read as a uh, civil war. Remember that the firstborn were killed of, of the Egyptians and the uh, Israelites. Um, I'm just trying to think what the King James Version says. I think they say borrowed all of the riches from the Egyptians. But if you read it in the uh, Hebrew, it translates much better as plundered not borrowed. Um, and so they borrowed all of the treasures from the Egyptians. Uh, this was a civil war. This was a real war. This was not just slaves being pushed out of Egypt. And so they went on an exodus. And several hundred thousand people left from Pyramasi and went to Jerusalem. But that happened in both cases. The Israelites left from Pyramasi. The Hyksos left from Avarice in the Nile Delta. But of course, Avarice is Pyramasi. It's the same town. Different name, but the same town. Um, there's just like, you know, 500, well, not quite 500 years, 350 years between the two different names. Um, and they both went to Judea, to Jerusalem. Both of these groups, the Hyksos uh, and the um, uh, the Israelites, and they both destroyed Jericho. So here's a, a recent artist's impression of the walls coming, tumbling down. Now, the destruction of Jericho was most probably done by the Hyksos. Um, I think one of the best explanations for this is by um, Ahmed Osman in his... Um, Stranger in the Valley of the Kings, I think it was. And uh, he gave about 15 reasons why it was the Hyksos who destroyed Jericho. And of course, that's one of the reasons why classical um, Egypt, Egyptologists and uh, theologians cannot find the Israelite exodus in the historical record. A, they're looking in the wrong era, which doesn't help. They're looking 350 years too late. B, they say, well, you know, High, um, Jericho had been abandoned for 300 years before the Exodus. So that has to be made up. It cannot be historical. It cannot be factual. Because Jericho had been abandoned for 300 years. Yeah, well, that only applies if you're desperate to have the Exodus event, the biblical Exodus, in the... Um, sort of Ramesside period. If the Israelites are the Hyksos, then it was the Hyksos Israelites who destroyed Jericho. And it happened in about 1580 BC, which is the date for the Hyksos Exodus, as far as we know. Um, under Pharaoh uh, Armosi I. Um, and remember, this exodus was a long, drawn-out affair because the civil war started under Carmosi and it ended under Armosi, who was the next uh, pharaoh. So it went on for some time, at least 20 years, this civil war was simmering and getting worse. So that is the, those are the similarities um, between, and I'll just do a quick stop share on that, Stop sharing. So I'm back again. Those were the first similarities that I found between the Hyksos and the Israelites. And then, of course, I went in to um, read the rest of Josephus because he gives a lot of this history and it's very interesting. Um, and when you jump into uh, against Appian, Josephus Flavius says that the Israelites were the Hyksos. So he's confirming this. Um, so here's a quote from uh, Josephus. He says, Manetho states, he's quoting from Manetho. Now, Manetho is the uh, Egyptian historian from uh, 3rd century BC. Um, and he spoke Egyptian. So, I mean, he has a distinct advantage over us because Manetho spoke Egyptian. And he was only 
300 years before Josephus, so not that um, much older. Um, so Josephus says, Manetho states that this race, the so-called so shepherds, the Hyksos, rem remember they were called the shepherd kings, were described as captives in their sacred books. In this statement, he is correct. Sheep breeding was a hereditary custom of our remote ancestors. So he's talking about the um, Hyksos being shepherds. And he says, yes, sheep breeding was a hereditary custom of our remotest ancestors. And this nomadic life, they came to be called shepherds. He's directly equating the Hyksos with the Israelites. But their other name of captives in the Egyptian record uh, was given not without reason, since our ancestor, Joseph, told the king of Egypt that he was a captive. Again, he's making a direct link between the Joseph, this is the Old Testament Joseph, uh, him of the coat of many colors, and the Hyksos. He is saying that Joseph was a Hyksos because they were both called captives. Um, and then he goes on, that was in uh, Appian 14, against Appian. And then Appian uh, 16, he says, such is Manetho's account. And if the years which he enumerates are summed up, it is clear that um, the so-called shepherds, our ancestors, left Egypt and settled in our country 393 years before Danis came to Argos. Um, yeah, uh, the dating is a little bit out there because that would date it as being very, very early. Uh, Danis um, is most probably Pharaoh I from the Amarna dynasty of Akhenaten and Nefertiti. Um, the, uh, the royal line goes from Akhenaten to Smenkara uh, to Tutankhamun and then to Pharaoh I. And it seems obvious that I is Danus. Uh, it was one of the names for Pharaoh I. Um, so, yeah, he is saying that the so-called shepherds were our ancestors. And he's very clear about that. That's very, very clear that Josephus Flavius thought that the Israelites were the Hyksos pharaohs of Egypt. Now, we tried to put this into Wiki. And of course, Wiki is controlled by woke uh, gatekeepers. And it was deleted. So we put it in. It was deleted. We put it back in. It was deleted. This went on. It went in about 12 times. It was deleted 12 times. Um, and if you go into the pages behind, there's some um, discussion pages in the back of Wiki. Um, and this went on for about 36 pages of discussion. And they would not have this quote from, um, from Josephus Flavius. This was in the page about the Exodus, I think. We were trying to put it in the Exodus page. And all we were trying to do is put in the, that quote. Um, it is clear uh, that the so-called shepherds, our ancestors, left Egypt and settled in our country. That was deleted time and time again. Uh, the reason was because Josephus is an unreliable historian. And therefore, you cannot have quotes from Josephus which is utter BS, because if you look at sort of any sort of New Testament history on Wiki, and you'll find thousands, hundreds of thousands of quotes from Josephus, because he's the only person you can quote um, about uh, events from the New Testament era. And so, yeah, of course you can quote from Josephus, but anyway, they wouldn't have it. And it ended up with me getting kicked off Wiki. I got deleted for trying to put that into wiki so that's why you will not find this information in classical history or in wiki i think there might be a later because one of my compatriots who was trying to do this managed to get a mention in there somewhere on wiki about um, the israelites being the hyksos so you might find a um uh, a link there somewhere um so yes, that's the interesting part of it, is that we're putting the Israelites back into Egypt, which is where they came from, of course, but not as slaves, 
but as pharaohs of Egypt, Hyksos pharaohs of Egypt. So these were important people. They were powerful people. The Hyksos were the most powerful nation in that region at the time. These were the people who had the composite bow and the chariot, which the southern Egyptians did not have. Um, so, yeah, um, it puts a slightly different spin on the Old Testament story. The story is the same, which is interesting. Like we were looking at the New Testament material, the story remains exactly the same. But the context changes. Instead of being slaves in Egypt, now the Israelites um, were powerful people in Egypt. They were pharaohs of Egypt. They controlled Egypt um, for a number of years. And they probably came back into Egypt. Uh, and they came back, I think, during the Amarna period. And now we go back into the Old Testament, into Genesis. And I think we have an out of place um we have an out of place section in uh early part of genesis and i was just going to quickly look up uh a quick picture here because i think um the genesis story has been misplaced and um I'm just going to have to do another quick screen share. So what is the um, Genesis story about? Um, it's, it's about the two naked lovebirds in the Garden of Eden. Um, <clears throat> Adam and Eve, of course, who were always naked in the Garden of Eden. Um, where did this story come from? Uh, I think it actually came out of the Amarna era. And this section of the Bible has been misplaced. It's in the wrong place. So who were the two naked lovebirds in the garden of the Eton or Eden? Um, well, they were most probably... My screen share didn't work, so I'll just have to do that again. <laughs> we'll get the hang of this eventually. So that's sharing. Ah, now we have some naked lovebirds. Um, who were the naked lovebirds in the garden of the Eton? I think it was these people. This is Akhenaten and Nefertiti. And they were indeed the two naked lovebirds in the garden of the Aten. But of course, the Aten is spelt with the reed glyph, which, as we've seen before, is more like a modern E than it is our modern A. So it wasn't the, the god of Akhenaten was not the Aten, it was the Eton. And sometimes it's spelt with a D, so sometimes it was called the Eden. And, of course, in Egypt, the pharaohs all had a royal garden, uh, a sacred garden dedicated to the gods. So in this case, it would be dedicated to the um, Eton, the Aten, and it would be a garden of the Aten god, the Garden of Eden. And these were the two naked lovebirds in that garden. This is uh, on the, the left here, the left-hand character, that's Pharaoh Akhenaten. And as you can see, he's always portrayed in this sort of androgynous sort of uh, shape with um, a slight bust and narrow waist and large hips in a sort of semi-female fashion. Uh, and no genitalia, because he's naked in this. You can see with his uh, navel there, very prominent. Uh, he's being portrayed as androgynous, and there's probably a good reason for that. He's probably the um, uh, the primeval Adam, as the Nazarene called it in later years in the first century. Uh, the Nazarene believed in the uh, primeval Adam, and the primeval Adam was either hermaphrodite or he was androgynous, just like Pharaoh Akhenaten was. 
Now in the center, we've got Nefertiti. Now this is Nefertiti in middle age by the looks of it, and she's naked. And this must have been rather shocking, even for the Egyptians. I'm sure it probably was. Um, and, and she must have done this in the garden of the Eton, the Arton, because no sculptor would be bold enough to portray the queen as naked if she hadn't asked for this and commissioned this statue in this fashion. She must have uh, strolled naked throughout the Garden of Eton. Uh, and this must have been very shocking. I mean, this would be like uh, the late Queen Elizabeth II going around Buckingham Palace and Buckingham Palace Gardens stark naked. And we have images of, I don't have one here, I don't think. Um, we have images of them on the window of appearances. No, I don't have one here. Um, on the window of appearances at Amarna, so at state occasions where they're giving awards to people, and they're standing on the balcony, stark naked. This would be like Queen Elizabeth II on the balcony of Buckingham Palace with all of the, you know, the throng um, of the crowds outside, and she's naked giving out the awards. This was probably shocking, I think, within um, Egypt and probably worth someone recording these unusual events. And then the one on the right here in Porphyry, uh, this is supposed to be one of the daughters of Nefertiti. Uh, someone like Ankesenamun, one of those, um, her elder daughters. Yeah, that is probably what we've got when we're talking about the Genesis story of two naked lovebirds in the Garden of Eden, the Eton. Uh, that's why they're portrayed in this fashion. And that is why when they were kicked out of uh, Eden, uh, they had to cover up. It's exactly the same as Akhenaten and Nefertiti had to do when they were kicked out of Amarna, because there's no evidence that they died in Amarna. They went on an exodus. Um, and this is probably what they were talking about. And um, the next image is apropos nothing in particular. It's just to show how secrets can be held in plain sight, if you have not been initiated uh, into the secrets of Christian theology or Judaic theology. This is the very famous Michelangelo painting from the Sistine Chapel um, of Adam uh, touching God, the spark of illumination from God going into Adam for the creation epic. Um, but why is God portrayed in that fashion? Why is God a series of robes? What's that all about? Um, well, Michelangelo knew exactly what this was about because this again comes from Nazarene theology. Um, this is a brain. This is a, a, a cross-section of a human brain. And he's drawn it in that fashion because the Nazarene believed that God was uh, closely connected to the brain. And so he's drawn it in this fashion so that only the initiated would know that. And you could also think of this as God is only in the mind if you wanted to be really heretical. Um, but anyway, that's how secrets can be held in plain sight and they can last for hundreds of years and nobody sees them until someone comes along and says, that's a brain. Um, anyway, going back to Adam and Eve, of course they, Eve went and plucked the fruits from the tree of life and the tree of knowledge in the garden of Eden. What on earth was that talking about? Well, it was talking about this. Uh, this is from Karnak, 
down in Egypt. And this is the tree they were talking about. Uh, this goes back 3,200 years. This is Seti the first. So this is just before the Ramesside period. No, during the Ramesside period. Um, and here we have Thoth, uh, who is the god of knowledge and writing, of course. And he's drawing. I don't know if you can see he's got a stylus here, a pen. And he's drawing the name of the king on the fruits of the tree. And in this case, he's drawing Seti the first on the fruits and hanging them on the tree. You can see them hanging off on the tree, all over the tree. And Seti the first is looking at his name on the tree, the tree of life, because this is a family tree. It's much the same as you would see in an um, aristocratic house in Britain uh, where they trace their genealogy. And you will often see the genealogy of this important family drawn as a tree with all of the different characters um, going down the tree um, or rather going up the tree from the stem at the bottom, going up the tree to the uh, current incumbent of the great house. This is what this was, I believe. This was a genealogy. Uh, in this case, we've only got Seti the first on this tree, but you can imagine a tree with all of the names of the pharaohs on the tree. So anyone who goes around cutting out the names, plucking the fruits from the tree, they are destroying the names of the previous pharaohs and dynasties. Of course, that would cause some contention. And of course, this is exactly what Akhenaten and Nefertiti were doing. Not so much with the pharaohs, but they were cutting out the names of the gods all over Egypt. They sent their army all over Egypt to cut out the names of the gods because they wanted to replace uh, all of the Egyptian gods with the Aten, the symbol of the sun. Uh, and so, yes, they were plucking the fruits from the uh, tree of life. Um, this comes from my Jesus last of the pharaohs and Tempest and Exodus. Uh, both available on Amazon. Um, so I'll just stop sharing there. So um, what else was I going to say? I was going to say, yes, we have many links with, <coughs> excuse me, um, between the Old Testament and Egypt. And I was just looking for a list because I can't remember all of the list. Yeah. No, I don't have it. Anyway, many of the um, um, Old Testament events actually come out of uh, Egyptian history. So you'll find many things like the, um, the Lord's Prayer, the Ten Commandments, things of this nature come out of ancient Egyptian texts. And one of the course, one of the famous ones is the hymn to the Aten. We were talking about Akhenaten and Nefertiti. Um, well, the hymn to the Aten was supposed to be written by Akhenaten, but it's in the Bible as Psalm 104. And this has been known about for uh, decades, if not centuries. So this is not new. But it's something that's not mentioned very often, that the hymn to the Aten is in the Old Testament, which rather sort of links the Old Testament to the uh, Amarna dynasty of Akhenaten and Nefertiti. And I'll just give you a couple of quotes because it goes on and on and on this. Um, but anyway, I'll give you a couple of quotes from it. Uh, hymn to the Aten says, How many are your deeds? You made the earth as you wish. You alone all peoples, all herds, and all flocks. And Psalm 104 says, Yahweh, how many are your works? In wisdom you have made them. All of the earth is full of your creatures. Uh, hymn to the Aten says, When you, the Aten, set in the western light land, the earth is in darkness as if in death. Uh, and uh, the psalm says, You make the darkness and it is night when all of the animals of the forest come creeping out. Every lion comes from his den. 
the young lions roar for their prey when the sun rises. Uh, they withdraw and lie down in their dens. Uh, Artan says, um, when you have dawned, they live. When you set, they die. Talking about the sun, of course. Um, and then in uh, Psalms, it says, when you hide your face, because now it's talking about Yahweh, of course, not the sun, because you're not allowed to have the sun god, but there we go. When you hi hide your face, they are dismayed. When you take away their breath, they die. Um, him to the art and says, the entire land sets out to work. And uh, Psalm says, people go out to their work and to their labor in the evening, until the evening. And it goes on and on and on. It's, it's quite obvious that um, the hymn to the Arten has been preserved within Psalms. So we have direct links um, between the Amarna dynasty um, and the um, Torah story. And of course, um, that's only to be expected. Oh, I missed this bit out. We were talking about the um, uh, the Garden of Eden. Well, where was Eden? There's been lots of debate about where Eden was, of course. Um, but um, perhaps the best description is uh, Genesis 2.10, um, which says, a, a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted, and it became four branches. So where was Eden? Uh, so there's a river that goes out of Eden, and then it is parted and becomes four branches. There is only one river in this region that does that, and that is the Nile. And of course, in, in this era, um, sorry, in that era, it used to do exactly that. So the river ran through um, the Garden of Eden, which you could either envisage as being Egypt itself, because it's a ribbon oasis that runs through the desert, or you can think of it as being the Garden of the Arten at Amarna itself. And it gets to Cairo, and then it is parted, and it becomes four branches. It's an exact description of the Nile. Um, nowadays, it's only split into two branches, but in uh, ancient times, it used to split into four. So um, we're, we're probably talking about the Nile here. And then, of course, the god of the Israelites was called the Arden. It has the same name as the god of Akhenaten. So the Israelite god had several names, I suppose. It was Yahweh the one we traditionally know. It was called El Elohim, um, Allah, or Ella. So the uh, Arabic god Allah is simply the uh, Israelite god. It was called Shaddai, the god of storms. And the god of the Israelites was also called the Adon. Adonai. Ah, well, that's interesting because the god of Akhenaten was called the Aten, or the Eton, as we've already said. But sometimes it was spelt with a D, so we get the Arden or the Eden. Uh, so they have the same god. Um, so the uh, Israelites were most definitely, in my view, uh, the Hyksos pharaohs of Egypt. Uh, and later something to do with the uh, Amarna dynasty. Um, and I think I've probably come to the end of that probably introduction. I don't know if any of you have any questions on what we were talking about here. Any questions from the floor? Um. Uh, let's see, what are the Amarna letters? Yeah, the Amarna letters are this enormous treasure trove of uh, correspondence um, of um, 
Akhenaten sending letters to all of his subordinate uh, nations around Amarna. Now, these were preserved because uh, I think the building they were in um, got burnt down, and these were, I think these were copies, because obviously the originals would be sent out. And uh, so we have a lot of correspondence from um, Akhenaten, and we have correspondence coming in from the province. Mm. And so we have letters, like, like we have the famous one about um, when Tutankhamun died, uh, we have letters from the um, Hittites sending a prince down into Egypt because Ankesenamun didn't have, I'm not sure why she didn't have, but anyway, she didn't have a suitor. She didn't have anyone to marry. And she, she was asking for a Hittite prince to come down uh, into Egypt. Um, but he never arrived. He went missing en route. Uh, because that was frowned upon, of course. Egypt had never taken a king or a prince from a foreign land into their royalty. And, and so a lot of people would have been against that. And so he went missing. So, yeah, we get a lot of interesting correspondence, which tells us that during the time of Akhenaten, there was unrest. Um, the provinces were uprising. There was um, there was uh, a um, an epidemic was running across the country, and uh, uh, there were problems with with finances. People were poor. Um, I think mainly because Akhenaten was a bit of a hippie. I mean, he was the archetypal hippie and probably wasn't caring about uh, the economy and the uh, society as much as he should have been. Um, I liken him to the um, the film um, Wild Wild Country from Netflix, which is a film about the uh, Rajesh community who ended up in America. They came from India. Um, I, th I think it's fairly well known, isn't it? The... Um, the Rajesh. Yeah. Hmm. Um, and they ended up in Oregon somewhere and they set up a new city, a new town from absolutely nothing. So you have this group of uh, hippies with all of their hangers on, several thousand, you know, there was quite a few people there. And they settled in Oregon and they set up their own town from nothing. They had to build this town from nothing, which is exactly what. Uh, Akhenaten had to do because Akhenaten was exiled from uh, northern Egypt. Uh, he was the son of Amenhotep the, the third, who was the uh, pharaoh in in command at the time, and his son, um, who was Akhenaten, was exiled into the middle of Egypt, into a barren place where there was nothing, and he had to build his city from nothing. Um, and then, of course, they, they, they built this city, and then tensions started arriving between the people because, of course, the people of Egypt, although they were nominally um, subject, subject to Akhenaten as the pharaoh, they didn't like him at all. He was known as the heretic pharaoh. There was lots of opposition. Same happened to the Rajesh community. There was lots of tensions when the within the community. They started to be infighting within the community. And they eventually, well, they poisoned the local town. That was a big event as well. They didn't like the heathens next door. So they poisoned the local town. And eventually they were all thrown out on an exodus. Mm. And they all had to leave. Well, exactly the same happened to Akhenaten. They all had to go out on an exodus because they were all kicked out of Amarna. And then we got to the reign of Tutankhamun. Now, the interesting thing about that is there are some distinct similar similarities with the Old Testament story. So we have the story of um, the Israelites being persecuted by Pharaoh. And Pharaoh is shouting at them, you are idle, you are idle. You will make mud bricks whether you have straw or no straw. Well, that's exactly what happened in Amarna because they had to build this new city out of nothing. And so 
Akhenaten was goading on his followers to unrealistic feats of building this new town and the palace and the temple and everything else that had to go with it. And so he was doing exactly the same. He was lashing the whip at these people. And we know this from the mass burials. So they actually had mass burials. He wasn't even burying people individually. And when they looked at all of these uh, um, uh, remains, all of these bones, the vast majority had been subject to very hard labor. Hmm. He was working his own followers to the bone, literally. So this matches very well with the uh, Old Testament story. The only thing the Old Testament will not tell you is the name of the Pharaoh concerned. And they don't want to tell you who the Pharaoh was, A, because it was Akhenaten, but B, it was their own Pharaoh. It was their own leader who was goading them on to ever greater feats of building, lashing the whip at them working them to the bone. It wasn't a foreign king. It was their own king. It was Akhenaten. Um, and then we have a, a, a further connection. We, in fact, we have many connections. But um, we have the, um, uh, the killing of, of the, the babes of the uh, Israelites. So mm -hmm. they were be, being killed by the, uh, the two midwives, uh, Shipra and Pura, if I remember their names correctly. Um, who were killing all of the Israelite boys, not the girls, just the boys. And we have a direct comparison with that, of course, with the Amarna dynasty, because Akhenaten only had girls. Huh. He had no sons. So he had six daughters and no sons, which is statistically um, improbable to have no sons. Mm. So why did Akhenaten not have any sons? Well... The Old Testament tells us it's because the two midwives were killing all of the sons when they came out. And so, again, it matches perfectly with the um, uh, Torah story. So there are many elements that indicate that um, some of this early Exodus story was something to do with the Amman era. Now, we've already seen the connections with the Exodus event um, and the Hyksos, that was back in 1580. Now we see some connections between uh, the Exodus story and the Amarna dynasty, which is circa about 1320. And I think what's happened is they've just conjoined these two stories. So we had um, the great Exodus of the Hyksos, and then we had the smaller Exodus of the Amarna dynasty of Akhenaten and Nefertiti. And they were two separate events. We get this from Manetho. Manetho says there were two separate exoduses. Uh, he says there was the great exodus of the Hyksos and then the smaller exodus of the 80,000 lepers and maimed priests. And of course, that's a good description of Akhenaten because Akhenaten was a, a theological leper. Uh, and you might say a maimed priest because he was the heretic pharaoh. Uh, and the biblical story has just amalgamated these two Exodus events uh, into one. But that would mean that within the Exodus story, we might have the names of the two main characters because the two main characters in the Old Testament story are Aaron and Moses. And the two main characters in the historical story are Akhenaten and Tuth Moses, because the brother of Akhenaten was called Moses. So mm -hmm. we have a direct connection between the two. Mm. Um, and we've got a question at the bottom here saying, is it safe to say that Joseph has perished by uh, Domitian? Um, <clears throat> Quite possibly, although I have a slightly different take on that, because we've not been through this in the New Testament uh, story we did last time. Um, I have a slightly different take on that in that I think he was probably exiled rather than being um, uh, being killed or executed or whatever. 
Um, I think he might have been exiled to Britain as well. We've not been through the reasons why there's a connection with Britain. Um, but we have these traditions of Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea coming to Britain. Very strong traditions of that within Arthurian legend. And of course, Josephus was called Josephus bar Matthias, Arimathias. And in our previous talk, we saw the connection there between Joseph of Arimathea and Josephus Flavius, how they are uh, seemingly very closely linked, possibly the same person. <coughs> so I think Josephus was probably actually exiled, which the Romans liked doing. They didn't always kill people. Quite often they exiled people instead. So I think, um, yeah, Josephus was exiled to Britain circa that would have been in the AD 80s, of course, uh, the era of Domitian. Um, I've got another one. Um, the uh, One of the late uh, chapters of Proverbs seems to be based on the wisdom of Amenemophis or some such name. Uh, what date would that be uh, compared like to the Psalm 104 or Agnaton's Hymn to the Sun? Same period or not that it matters much, I guess. You're breaking up a little bit there, Robert. Um, your data rate is very slow, so we're... we're we're only oh that's better try again um the um <laughs> break uh, again one of the chapters of proverbs seems to be derived from the wisdom of amen and Mophis. uh and uh, when might that borrowing have occurred uh, more or less the same time as psalm 104 and the hymn to the sun I didn't quite get that. Sorry, Robert. Um, I think you are asking about the dates for this. Yes. Um, so the dates uh, for the Great Exodus, the Hyksos Exodus, would have been 1580 uh, BC. That's quite a, a certain date because we have a very nice chronological peg that we can hang this on mm. um, because we get some people like um, Roll, um, who says that all of Egyptian history has been misplaced mm -hmm. by about 400 years or whatever he says. <clears throat> I think Roll is completely wrong on that because we have a very, very good chronological peg, which is the eruption of Santorini. Mm -hmm. Now, that's been dated quite well because they found olive trees that have been charred when this volcano erupted and they're actually buried inside the pumice. So we know those trees died at the time of the eruption. Now, they've been dated to about 1600 BC. Okay, so if the um, civil war brewed for about 20 years before the exodus happened, then we would come to a date of about 1580 BC. And that ties in quite well with the established date for Armosi the first, who uh, who's supposed to be the pharaoh of the Exodus, the southern Egyptian pharaoh of the Exodus, who's about 1570 BC. So it all ties in quite well at that time. So the Great Exodus would have been in about 1580 BC, and that's quite a firm date. Now the uh, second Exodus, uh, from the works of Manetho. Uh, it's quite obvious that they were talking about the Amarna dynasty. So the second exodus of the 80,000 lepers and maimed priests is obviously talking about Akhenaten and Nefertiti, and later on talking about Pharaoh Ai. Now that would have been circa about 1320 for Akhenaten, um, and maybe about uh, 1300 for Ai. So we've got um, 1320, so that's 80 up to 40, 15. Uh, so that's 260 years, isn't it? So there would have been 260 years between these two Exodus events. Hmm. I have one more, if you'll bear with me. Um, do you think that the story of Joseph is based on that of Osiris? 
I, I sorry, I didn't catch that yeah. again, uh, Robert. Perhaps you, you could type it maybe into the uh, private chat, and I can read it off. Oh, let's see. How do I do that? Oh, is that over? And um, while while we're doing that, we could just look at um, uh, while while you're typing, we could just have a quick look at the other mystery, um, which is in the Old Testament, which is the location of um, uh, the location of Mount Sinai. How can the um, Israelites? lose their sacred mountain, the mountain upon which God used to reside inside this mountain. Um, you know, the Israelites, they, they write about everything. They note everything. How on earth could the Israelites have lost the location of their sacred mountain? I don't think they did. Uh, I think um, they should know exactly where it is. And we can get the location of their mountain by its description. It was said to be on the edge of a desert. It was the highest mountain in the region. It was sharp and it was difficult to climb. Uh, and although it was the biggest mountain in the region, you could actually cordon it off. You were not allowed to touch Mount Sinai. In fact, the penalty for touching Mount Sinai was death. So it was small enough that you could put a fence around it and cordon it off. And so, yeah, it had a, um, uh, a cave inside it somewhere in which God resided. Um, and yeah, I've got that. Thanks, uh, Robert. I'll come on to that. And then at the bottom of um, Mount Sinai, there was this pavement that looked um, smooth and brilliant and looked like the night sky. So where was this um, sacred mountain? Well, I think it was actually here. And I'll do a quick share screen, although I don't have a proper image of it, but I'm sure we can probably find one. Um, it was this, which is my little image of the Great Pyramid of Egypt. Um, perhaps I should go and look for a better version. But uh, the Great Pyramid of Egypt um, has all of those attributes. It's on the edge of a desert. It is the um, largest mountain in the region. Um, it um, is uh, sharp and difficult to climb. It's the, the uh, it might be the largest mountain in the region, but it's small enough that you can cordon it off. Uh, it does have a cave inside it, which uh, in which God lived. It was a sacred mountain, of course, and it's um, it did have a pavement at the bottom, which was black and looked like the night sky, just as it says for Mount Sinai. And that was the great black basalt pavement, which sits at the bottom of the uh, Great Pyramid. And the second pyramid, I believe, has got one as well. Um, so, yeah, I believe Mount Sinai was actually the Great Pyramid of Egypt, which would wow. make sense if you were uh, uh, Egyptians and Egyptian pharaohs, because one of the great conundrums of the Old Testament is these people, the Israelites, were in Egypt. For hundreds of years, even by the um, uh, by, by the views of the uh, Torah itself, and they never went to the Great Pyramid, the greatest monument in the ancient world. You know, the greatest wonder in the ancient world. They never went to the pyramids for a cup of tea or whatever, even if it was a. I mean, they were residing. Um, Joseph was in Heliopolis, which is North Cairo. You can probably see the Great Pyramid from, from Heliopolis. Um, there's this vast mountain sitting, man-made mountain sitting on the horizon there. Um, of course they would have known about the Great Pyramid, but why don't they ever mention the Great Pyramid and the other pyramids in the Old Testament? And the answer, of course, is they do. They're called Mount Sinai, Mount Seir, Mount <laughs> Hor. They are the mountains that the Israelites used to compass, it says, um, 
circumperambulate, it says in the King James Version. I love the language in the King James. Um, they used to circumperambulate the uh, mountains, which means they used to walk round and round them. Um, <clears throat> yeah, that's exactly what you can do, especially down at Dashur. You can actually walk around the uh, pyramids. And if you regarded them as sacred, then, of course, you might well have done that. So that's a quick explanation of that. And coming on to um, Robert's question, it says, was the story of Joseph and his brothers a retelling of the story of Osiris betrayed by his brother Set? It could well be. Um, these uh, these uh, stories were retold through the ages. And all of the... <clears throat> All of the pharaohs and all of the important people in Egypt used to regard themselves as incarnations of one god or another. Mm. And so, yes, uh, this is a bit like Jesus um, carrying out all of the prophecies. Mm. He cannot be the Jesus character and be as important as he wanted to be if he did not fulfill the prophecy. And so he has to base his life on what the prophecy said. Hmm. Well, back in Egypt, they used to do the same thing. It wasn't necessarily prophecy. It was the old stories of the gods. And if you could base your life on the uh, story of the gods, then, of course, you were an incarnation of that god. And all of the pharaohs of Egypt were the sons of a god. Tuthmosis is the son of Thoth. Yes, Ra right. Moses is the son of Ra. Ah Moses is the son of the moon god, Ah. And that may well be where we get uh, Yahweh from. Yahweh, Yah in ancient Egyptian means the moon. So it's likely that Yahweh is the moon god. Hmm. El or uh, Elohim, Eli, is the sun god. We know this because when the Greeks got that name, they turned it into Helios. Hmm. And we know that's the same name because the sacred stone of Syria was either called the Elagabal, which is using the, um, the Aramaic Ella, or El, or it was called the Heliogabal, which is using the Greek Helios. So it's directly equating Ella, or El, with Helios, um, the Greek sun god. So it's quite obvious that El is the sun god. And then we've got the Arten or the Arden, which is the other name for the um, uh, for the Israelite god, which is the god of Arkanaten, which is sort of like the sun, but some people say it's the power behind the sun, not the sun exactly. Um, but that is another god from Egypt. And then Shaddai is the storm god, so he's a bit like Set. So we're talking about Set here. Um, mm. Yeah, uh, Set... Um, Set is the storm god, uh, so he's a bit like Shaddai, but he's also a bit like uh, Satan or Setan. Um, I think there might be a link there. I mean, the link is not obvious, um, but there may be an epigraphic uh, uh, link between Set and Satan. Um, and Osiris, of course, is because we know that they've taken these traditions and used them. Um, Osiris is the original dying and rising god, mm. which is obviously the same as the resurrection for uh, Jesus and Lazarus and all of the others that were resurrected. But also it's part of the Trinity because the Trinity was um, Osiris, uh, Isis, and Horus. Mm. And then Osiris died, of course, and so you get Isis and Horus. And Isis and Horus was just taken uh, as the Madonna and child. And uh, we can probably, people have probably seen this already, but um, I'll just quickly look up an image for this because um, people might not have seen this image. So I'll do a quick screen share. So that should be coming up very shortly. And yeah. there we have it. So, 
Mm. Very, very common imagery that we see, uh, and that this has been pointed out by by many authors, of course, um, mm. <clears throat> that um, Isis and Horus on the right hand side is just being copied uh, by the Madonna and Child within the Catholic Catholic uh, symbolism, and in fact the Madonna and Child in the Pantheon in uh, Rome. If you go to the Pantheon, um, they've got a um, a statue of Isis there. Sorry, they've got a statue of Mary the Mother there, but it's not. It's actually Isis, and they've just put a different crown on her head. So they've just reused an old um, statue of Isis. Um, so yeah, this this imagery has come down through the ages out of Egypt. All of this religion has come out of Egypt, whether it's old Judaism or Christianity. Remember, Christianity came out of Egypt. Out of Egypt, I have called my son. Um, Jesus went to Egypt for his education. I think he went to uh, to Alexandria. Uh, the, the Talmud says that Jesus came out of Egypt with the uh, secret name of God tattooed on his thigh. Um, so the, there's a lot of this Egyptian um, knowledge and symbolism came out and, and has ended up in Christianity. Um, that's why I call the um, I, I call the original Judaism of Jesus and James because remember they were Nazarene, um, they were not uh, Orthodox Jews. Uh, I call that Egypto uh, Judaism because there was lots of these old elements of Egyptian theology that were still left in this religion, which is why they venerated the uh, zodiac, which is why you have all of these old zodiacs running around in um, Judea and uh, Jordan. So all of the early um, synagogues in this area have a zodiac on the floor. And I think we looked at these last time, mm -hmm. the uh, zodiacs. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that comes, that's a part of the Egyptian heritage that has flowed through into Nazarene Judaism, um, which is all very interesting stuff. Um, just wondering what else we can quickly talk about. I think that's probably it really, unless there are other questions from the floor. If anyone else has any more questions about this. Um, what's this one? Would have been like a beacon out in the middle of the empty desert as well. Um, if you're talking about uh, Santorini, um, it wouldn't be visible from Egypt. Um, so the distance uh, that we have from Egypt to Santorini, it would be well over the horizon. Although you might see the tops of the clouds if the clouds went up to 60,000 foot or something, you might just see the spreading clouds come out. But what would have happened is that we know that fishermen and traders were going across the Mediterranean and they saw this enormous great eruption um, and they went up close to it. We, we have even the story from, uh, I think it's Jason and the Argonauts, um, where they get caught in three days of darkness yet again um, when the sun disappears and their uh, ship starts getting covered in uh, rocks that are being thrown at them by the Talos, I think it is, the Talos. And there's this, there's this great monster in the sea um, that's throwing these rocks. And the ankle of this uh, great monster, if it gets cut, it flows with the ichor of the gods, as it calls it, which looks like molten lead. Well, that's a perfect description of a lava flow going into the sea. If you have a look at some of the videos or images of the eruptions on the Hawaiian mm -hmm. Islands, 
you will see sometimes these enormous great lava flows pouring into the sea. And they look exactly like molten lead pouring into the sea, which is exactly the description we get from the Greeks. Now, those sailors would have been going um, around the Mediterranean. They would have come from Egypt as well. Um, and they would have been taking these stories back to Egypt that look, there's this great pillar of fire and this pillar of smoke out into the Mediterranean and um, those stories would have come back to Egypt more than that a lot of the refugees who came out of uh, Santorini they went to uh, Crete to the Minoan Empire and a lot of those Minoans because the Minoans got devastated by this tsunami as well I mean the 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 evidence for this tsunami is is all over the north coast of uh, Crete. And it, it didn't quite destroy the Minoan Empire, but it severely crippled it. And many people from the Minoans retreated to the mountains and didn't come down again for a couple of hundred years. They just stayed up in the mountains because they were so afraid of the coast. And some of those refugees from from the Minoans ended up uh, in the Nile Delta. And they built a palace, uh, which was excavated by BTEC, I think. Um, they built a palace in the Nile Delta on the north coast, on the Mediterranean coast. So we know those uh, Minoans were in Egypt, and they would have brought these stories with them. And we sort of know that there was... <clears throat> A connection between the Minoans and the Amarna dynasty of Akhenaten and Nefertiti because everyone if you, if you go to Amarna and see the uh, artistry that they have all of the iconography and paintings and murals and whatever frescoes that they have there it's radical it's new it's naturalistic very artistic it's completely different to any of the um, Egyptian artistry that went before it. And everyone says this was a, a new form of art introduced by Akhenaten. Yeah, but not really. This is Minoan. <laughs> it's pure Minoan artistry. So it's quite obvious to me, although I don't think many people have made much of, much of this, that Akhenaten knew of these Minoan refugees who are up in the Nile Delta and he liked uh, their new form of art and that's the art that he took with him um, to Amarna in central Egypt and that's why we have this different artistry it's pure Minoan so yes they would have been very familiar with those stories from the Minoans about this great pillar of fire and pillar of smoke and I think you're you're back on there, Robert. I can see you properly now. I think you're back online. Uh, have you ever seen the nineteen um, sixties movie Jason and the Argonauts? Mm, yes, I love that. It has Talos and the heel and the oh, it's great. <laughs> the whole um, works, yeah. Uh, uh, which is interesting because that if if that is correct, then that puts a date on Jason and the Argonauts, because of course the dating of Jason and the Argonauts is, is very fluid. You can't really place it into history. But if it's talking about Santorini, then Jason and the Argonauts is 1600 BC. Hmm. It's a beautiful peg, you know, a historical peg upon which you can hang all of this history. And I mm -hmm. love these historical pegs. Um, the other one is Gilgamesh, of course. Um, I wonder if I have an image of that. Um, we have all of these wild dates for Gilgamesh and all of these wild stories. Um, Gilgamesh obviously comes out of um, Sumer, out of um, Mesopotamia. And um, do we have Gilgamesh? Gilgamesh, Gilgamesh, Gilgamesh. Uh, let me look at Orion then. And I don't know why there's, there's such a mystery about Gilgamesh, because this is all connected, because they were talking about the same thing. Um, no, not that one. That one. 
Okay, so I'll do a quick screen share with this one. Um, so I'll present that, share a screen, and share that one. Is that sharing or not sharing? That's not sharing. Let me let me redo that. Share screen. Window. Share. It's down the bottom there. Um, perhaps it has to be accepted before it'll go up. Um, anyway, while it's thinking about going up, I'll just talk about it. Um, what is Gilgamesh? Gilgamesh is this story supposedly be about a king and uh, on his gallant deeds. And this is dated to anything up to about, you know, two and a half, three thousand BC sometimes, you know, because um, uh, history in, in uh, uh, Mesopotamia is, is quite fluid and nobody knows exactly when these things happened and kings reign for 500 years and things of that nature. I think it's perfectly obvious what um, uh, Gilgamesh is about. Um, so Gilgamesh, and I do really want him to come up. Gilgamesh goes off with his bow and his club or his axe, and he's trying to kill the um, bull of heaven. <laughs> well, the bull of heaven, again, it's not quite coming up. Let me see. It's there, ready to go up. I don't know if it can be accepted. Um, and, um, yes, he has a sword hanging from his belt as well. Well, who is Gilgamesh then? Gilgamesh is obviously Orion. He's the constellation of Orion. He's not a real king. As ever, all of the stories from the ancient world were talking about the gods and talking about the cosmos. And so it is Orion that has his bow and his club and his belt, his sword hanging from his belt. Mm. And it is Orion, if you look in the north, in, in, in the skies above, and my screen won't share, so you can't see it, um, but it is Orion who is threatening Taurus, who is the next door constellation right, right next door. Oh. Orion is pointing at Taurus, the bull of heaven. I mean... It, Mm. Taurus is the only real bull of heaven, and Orion is threatening him with his bow and his axe uh, or club. Now, Gilgamesh cannot kill the bull of heaven because he has to deal with the Humbaba, the six splendors of the Humbaba, uh, which are protecting the bull of heaven. So what are they? It's quite obvious that they are the Pleiades. Hmm. It's the Pleiades that sit on the neck of Taurus in the night sky, just sitting above Taurus. And it is the Pleiades, the Humbaba, that are stopping Gilgamesh from attacking the neck of Taurus. Hmm. Well, yeah, in the night sky, that's exactly what the Pleiades are doing. Um, so it's quite obvious that Gilgamesh is talking about Orion attacking and killing the bull of heaven. Now, when did that happen? That happened in 1750 BC. So again, we get one of these very, very nice chronological pegs upon <clears throat> which we can hang this data, because this is all connected with the um, procession of the equinox. Yeah. So in the procession of the e equinox, the great month of Taurus, changed into the great month of Aries, the sheep, in 1750 BC. That's why we went from Apis bull worship into the shepherd kings, the Hyksos. That's why they were called the shepherd kings. It was nothing to do with um, uh, looking after sheep. It was all to do with the heavens once again. This was the great month of Aries, and so they called themselves shepherd kings. Um, and that happened in 1750 BC. <laughs> So that means that Gilgamesh, the Gilma Gilgamesh story, is 1750 BC or later. And the Hyksos story 
has to be 1750 BC or later. And that's exactly when we find the Hyksos. They start to arrive in Egypt in 1750 BC. Um, and so it makes perfect sense of both of those uh, historical histories that we have. And it then also explains the, um, uh, the Joseph story. So Joseph, uh, him of the coat of many colors, um, he goes down into Egypt and he rises to become the um, prime minister of Egypt, which again shows that these people were important. And it shows again that they were Egyptian. To be the prime minister of Egypt, Joseph would have had to have spoken fluent Egyptian. And he would have to be uh, conversant with all of the standard Egyptian gods. He had to be Egyptian. Otherwise, he could not be the prime minister of Egypt, the vizier, as they tended to call them. Um, so anyway, he's prime minister of Egypt, and he invites his brothers to come down into Egypt, and they come down into Egypt. And he goes to see them, and he says, look, before you see Pharaoh, um, sorry, when you see Pharaoh, you must say, um, you must not say you are shepherds because shepherds are an abomination to uh, the uh, Egyptian. Uh. You must instead, you must say that you are cattle breeders. Otherwise, you will not be able to stay in the lands of Egypt. And that makes no sense in terms of agriculture whatsoever. But of course, it was not talking about agriculture. This was talking about the heavens above. So what Joseph was saying is, don't say to Pharaoh that you are the shepherd kings, the Hyksos, mm. because you will not be allowed to stay in the lands of Egypt because you've, you've just had a massive civil war between um, the Hyksos and the, the southern Egyptians back in 1580 BC. So don't say you are shepherd kings, the people who venerated the uh, great month of Ares, because you will not be allowed to stay in the land of Egypt. Say instead that you are cattle breeders, that you venerate the Apis bull of Egypt, and then you will be allowed to stay in Egypt. That's what they were talking about. And I like that interpretation of this because it means that we have a verbatim conversation between the prime minister and his brothers and Pharaoh dating from something like 1400 BC, that they must have had um, stenographers, basically, with their papyrus in, in hand and a piece of clay or something, actually taking notes of what was being said at that time. Because it appears that we have a verbatim transcript of the conversation between Pharaoh and his prime minister, dating from about 1400 BC, uh, which I find fascinating that you can mm. actually preserve, a, you know, conversations from that era. Mm. And of course, who was um, uh, who was Joseph? Well, I don't write about this because I think it's all been written by Ahmed Osman. There was no point in me writing anything about that. I think he's spot on. Uh, Ahmed Osman in his Stranger in the Valley of the Kings identified uh, Joseph as being Yuya. Yuya was the patriarch of the Amarna dynasty of uh, Akhenaten and Nefertiti. So uh, we had the patriarch was uh, Yuya and his wife Athuyu. And they are both now in the Egyptian Cairo Museum. So you can go and see them. And they are both... Um, they are both ginger, of course. They are ginger heads, <laughs> which just adds to the uh, interest. Um, people get very um, upset when I say that the Amarna dynasty were ginger. Um, but yeah, they probably were. The there? Well, why do they get upset? I know you're right. I've, I've heard that. What's the big deal? <laughs> oh, because so many people nowadays, uh, so many of the woke brigade that <laughs> we've been talking about, um, they say that uh, all of the uh, Egyptian pharaohs were black Africans, you see. And uh, so you're, you're not allowed to say that they were ginger. Well, there was like a, a Nubian dynasty or something, right? But that was the exception to the rule. 
and that was much later. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, there was a little bit of Nubian. Um, there's one little addition to this from Josephus Flavius, um, who writes his parallel Old Testament, of course. So he has the same story. Um, he says that during this era, and he's talking about Moses, of course, um, <clears throat> Moses, uh, the Egyptians had a battle with the Nubians. And uh, Moses was the chief army commander mm. Uh, mm. of the Egyptian army. And he had a battle with the Nubians and defeated them. And then he married the um, Nubian princess. Or no, in fact, she was the Nubian queen. And her name was Tharbis. And so he took Tharbis back to Egypt as a captured um, prize, as his queen. Or at least one of his uh, concubines, of course. Um, so, yeah, that's the story, the equivalent story from Josephus Flavius. And in many respects, I believe Josephus Flavius more than I do the Torah. Um, because it's it's more realistic. Um I mean, going back to this same era when it's talking about uh, Abraham, uh, the Torah will say that um, Abraham had 318 servants. Hmm. And you think, well, that's quite some shepherd, you know. Hmm. What shepherd on a Welsh hill <laughs> or even in deepest America um, looking after his flocks of sheep, you know, as they like to portray it, which shepherd would have 318 servants? It's not going to happen, is it? There's something wrong with this story. However, if you go into the works of Josephus, he tells the same story. Um, but he says that Abraham had 318 army commanders. Mm hmm. Now, that makes a difference, because if each one of those army commanders was a centurion, then Abraham had a standing army of 30,000 men. Hmm. Now, there was only one shepherd in this era who had a st standing army of 30,000 people. And that was the shepherd kings, the hmm. Hyksos. So again, we have confirmation that the Israelites were indeed the Hyksos pharaohs of Egypt. Um, so, yeah, all of these pointers, you see, some people say, oh, you can't say that, um, you know, you can't make that comparison. Well, it's not that comparison. It is two dozen comparisons, all pointing towards the same uh, result, the same uh, hypothesis. Um, and more and more of these connections start coming in as you start looking into it. So initially I found, you know, five or six comparisons and then it became 10 uh, equivalencies and then it became 15 and 20 and more. Um, so all of these different aspects all point towards the same story that the, uh, the ancient Israelites were the Hyksos pharaohs of Egypt. Um, I mean, how, how can you have a pharaoh and an Israelite patriarch with the same name, <laughs> if they're not connected. They were both called Jacob, Jacob. Um, there are so many comparisons, and there are many other of the Hyksos pharaohs. Uh, I go through all of the Hyksos uh, pharaohs and link them up with the patriarchs from the Torah. And many of them have very similar names, like mm. Abraham. Well, there was a pharaoh called Mam Mamabra. <laughs> Um, Abra, Abramam, yeah, it, it, it could well be the same character. Um, mm -hmm. But again, it's not just one uh, translation. It's not one similarity. It's multiple similarities. But the, well, the idea of Abraham with uh, over 300 servants conducting a war against these other kings. What has he got his, his gardeners and his, uh, his cooks and butlers out there? I, I mean, it's, it's, yes. it's that. Um, all, all of these stories, they, they have modified all of these stories to reduce very important, very powerful people into mere paupers like they did with the Jesus character, and we've discussed oh, that already. Hmm. Hmm. And there's a good reason for doing so, because if you wish to keep a people together, the best way to do that is to play the persecution card. 
Hmm. We've got to stay together because of all of these terrible people that are trying to persecute us. It's the Egyptians. Hmm. They want to kill us. It's, it's the whoever, you know, they're all trying to kill us. So we've got to stay together. And it's very difficult to say that if you're saying, well, we were actually the most powerful people in the world, but we got defeated by the Egyptians. Ah, no, that's a different, that's a difficult sell. So it's much easier to say, well, we were just we, we, we were just poor people, poor shepherds, and we were being persecuted by those terrible Egyptian pharaohs. So we have to stay together as a group, and that way we'll survive because God will look after us, etc., etc., etc. And that's exactly what they do. Um, and they've played that card for centuries, for thousands of years. But, I mean, that card is played by everybody. Hmm. It's played by um the muslims today every atrocity by muslims is caused because they are persecuted hmm. yeah but it's you that did the bombing no 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 the bombing only happened because we were a persecuted hmm. people hmm. and so again they play this persecution card uh if you want to get political so does blm so does uh, trans, so does everybody. Everybody plays the persecution card because it always works. And it worked 3,000 years ago with the Israelites. They played exactly the same card. But that means you've got to change your powerful leaders into poor shepherds. That mm. means you've got to change your king of Edessa into a pauper prince of peace who's only a carpenter um, because otherwise the story doesn't work. And we were all persecuted by the Romans. You know, this is from the um, New Testament era. We were persecuted by the Romans. There's not actually very much evidence for that. All of the persecution, I believe, was actually against the church of Jesus and James, not against the simple Judaism uh, uh, of, of Saul, which in my terms became Christianity. Um, Christianity came from Saul. It didn't come from Jesus and James. It was Saul who was the apostle to the Gentiles. And it was the, uh, the Gentile church that became Christianity. Hmm. So, yeah, there was lots of persecution by the um, uh, Flavian emperors. But that persecution was against the Nazarene church of Jesus and James, who they didn't want because they were messianic. They were revolutionary, and they wanted to destroy them. But, of course, you don't get that idea from uh, looking at Christianity. Um, so there was a little question here by uh, Kasanak. Um, what's he saying? He says, great catch by Ralph, the idea of the Mount Sinai being a pyramid. A circumambulation is still done at the Kaaba. Yes, I mentioned that. Um, it mentions in, in the uh, Torah that the Israelites used to circumperambulate the mountains, hmm. which I'm interpreting, uh, interpreting as being walking around the pyramids, which you can do at Dashur. It's, it's more difficult at uh, Giza, but at Dashur, you can walk around in a great perambulation around the pyramids. And I think that was an ancient ritual that they used to do. And that's what the Israelites were doing when they were on their exodus. They used to go round and round and round mountains for no good reason. Never explained. Why are they going round mountains? Well, because they were going round the pyramids. And of course, uh, as uh, Kasanak is, is indicating here, and it's in my book, uh, Tempest and Exodus, they still do that in Mecca today. They go to the great Me uh, Meccan mosque and they perambulate around the Kaaba in this great circulation of people uh, going round and round the Kaaba. Why are they doing it? Well, don't tell the Muslims, but what they're doing is they are representing the cosmos as above, so below, the old Masonic um adage that has has been said for you know hundreds of years um as the cosmos is above so we can represent it on the ground below so all of the people going around the kaaba are the same as the sky uh, as the stars 
rotating around the celestial pole. So if you look up at the night sky, you'll see all of the stars going around the celestial pole. That's what the people are doing. Each one of those people going around the Kaaba is a star rotating around the uh, pole star. So the Kaaba is the pole star, the navel. It's not really the navel of the universe. It's more like the axle of the universe. Mm. And that axle was very important. We even get it in Arthurian legend. It's known as uh, Arthur's uh, cosmic cart. And we get it in it, uh, Greek history as well. Again, they used to represent it as the two wheels of a cosmic cart. Mm -hmm. And again, if you look up at the night sky, we get the celestial pole is rotating. That's a big wheel. And then the other one is the ecliptic pole, which also rotates, but it rotates much slower. It's got a 26,000 year rotation. So you've got the two wheels of the cosmic cart going round together. Uh, which are the, the the two wheels of the celestial sphere and the ecliptic sphere. Um, that's what the cosmos does. That's what the old Sabaeans used to do. And in fact, the Sabaeans used to do this down in um, Saba. <clears throat> We're getting a bit off topic here, but I have a uh, another book which mentions the Sabaeans down in modern Yemen, uh, how they were renegade is Israelites from uh, from Jerusalem because nobody knows where these Sabaeans came from down in Saba, who created this marvelous civilization down in Saba with their enormous great dam at Marib, the, the huge great Marib dam, which they used to fertilize their fields and water them. Um, I had this idea that uh, during the Bab uh, Babylonian exile, so the Babylonian invasion of Judea, <clears throat> Jerusalem was destroyed and it had a, um, uh, a Babylonian um, a governor was put in place. Hmm. And then they had a second uprising against the Babylonian governor, which th succeeded. But then, of course, the Babylonians were coming back in again, and they all knew that the Babylonians were coming back in again. And so a new group of exiles went from Jerusalem. So they didn't go to Babylon this time with the other exiles who went to Babylon. They fled south into Egypt. And this is the story of the um, the mad prophet Jeremiah, wow. who, who was on this exile, and they ended up in Egypt. And then they go somewhere else, and it's not entirely explained exactly where they went to. I just got the impression that they went down into Saba because we end up with this new civilization in Saba, which can be connected in many respects with uh, Israelite society, culture, and language. There are many similarities between the two. And they venerate the Queen of Sheba. Well, they, they venerate, yeah, the Queen of Sheba. Uh, they call her Bilkis down there. And um, they made these are uh, temples which are strangely familiar or similar should i say to the kaaba up in mecca so they had these big um circular temples where people could indeed walk around and perambulate around a central icon that was in the middle they look remarkably like the great mosque at mecca and of course there's a connection there because um, the Marib Dam burst uh, in um, the 6th century, um, so the early 600s. And those people had to go on an exodus again because their dam had disappeared. And they went on an exodus north and they were met by Muhammad, no less. And it was Muhammad who gave them shelter. And then he says that for some reason they disrespected him or something, and so he killed them all or whatever. But at that time, we have these Sabaeans going up into the Arabias who are met by uh, Muhammad, who would have had, I believe, Judean texts with them as they went up from modern Yemen, from Saba, into uh, modern Arabias. 
And I think this is possibly where he got his Judean text from, which became the Quran. Because a lot of the Quran is Old Testament material, of course. It's all about Moses, about Abraham and monotheism, etc., etc. But it's quite obvious that the, um, uh, the, the texts that are in the Quran have a slightly different heritage to the standard uh, Old Testament that we have. It's slightly different. Uh, and where did Muhammad get these slightly different Judaic texts? I think there's a good possibility they came from Saba, uh, from the Sabaeans. And the Sabaeans just means, it means star worshiper. And um, modern historians don't seem to have tweaked this for some reason, uh, because they don't seem to know what Sabaean means, even though the, the Oxford English Dictionary still says Sabaean means star worshiper. Um, <clears throat> but that comes from the Egyptian word, um, Saba or Seba or even Sheba, which means star in ancient Egyptian. And that's where the word comes from. So they were indeed uh, star worshippers. But it also means that um, uh, the queen of Sheba was the queen of the stars, the queen of heaven, i.e. she was Isis. And remember that the Israelites, when they fled from Jerusalem with the mad prophet Jeremiah, um, they didn't worship Yahweh, they worshipped the Queen of Heaven. And it says that in the Old Testament all the way through, that they were worshipping uh, the Queen of Heaven. And of course, um, Jeremiah is, is haranguing them for this. You've got to worship uh, Yahweh. And they said, no, when we worshipped the Queen of Heaven, everything was fine. When we stopped worshipping the Queen of Heaven, everything um, went to a, a ball of chalk, as some people say. Everything went terrible. And that's when they went on their exodus. And so these people, these Jews, leaving Jerusalem, this would have been um, in the uh, 600s, Babylonian exile time. <clears throat> Five... 50s, 600s. They were... So, yes, it was um, a slightly uh, different Judaism to how we understand it today. Um, I wonder if we can now do a share screen. Will it do it or will it not? No, I think it's not going to do it. Anyway, so... Um, I think that's probably the end of the stream. So if anyone wants to just join in and uh, give our goodbyes to all of the viewers, um, I think we will be wrapping this up. So hopefully this um, video will be out in a day or two. And uh, hopefully everyone will tune into it because it's all very interesting stuff. And if you have any questions, of course, uh, do drop those questions into the uh, YouTube video and I will do my best to answer them. So um, this is Ralph Ellis saying thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. And we'll see you again next time. Thank you.